You're still watching news today on Afia TV, and I am Mavlis Apwamaga. Now, the social media space and in conventional media last Thursday was flooded with the mention of at least four Nigerians who died suddenly in the events surrounding the African Cup of Nations football match between Nigeria and South Africa. All of this, we are reported to have either slumped or died during or immediately after watching the very tense Nigerian South African match. Reacting to the development, however, the Nigerian Cardiac Society called on the government to increase the funding for health to encourage early and regular screening for cardiovascular risk factors. Joining me to talk about this is Dr. Neka Udora, consultant cardiologist, UNCH. You're welcome to the show. Thank you very welcome much. Welcome to the program. Okay. okay, so it is quite unfortunate that some of these victims passed away. It is a really sad one. So while others succumbed after returning home from the match, some died after returning and some some died while watching. Some died after returning. So what do you believe could have been the underlying cause of their death? Okay, so um the fact that the these deaths were sudden, you know, so there's something we call sudden death syndrome. Actually, so is a death occurring from natural causes, usually within one hour of onset of symptoms in the presence of no symptoms. So there may be symptoms, there may not be symptoms. It can also happen in a patient or an individual who's had a heart disease or not, or somebody who's never had a symptom at all. So um, it's usually, in most cases, I think mean, seventy-three percent of the cases originate from cardiac diseases, what we call heart diseases. So that's why when they talk about sudden death, everyone's mind goes to cardiac, cardiac. diseases, goes to sudden cardiac death. Okay, but it's all about sudden death. It's not I may mean, not necessarily come from the heart. So it's broader now as to what could have happened. You know, so it's a sudden death actually. So the next thing will now be. What are the causes of the sudden death? What could have happened, really? What are the underlying risk? Because these individuals may not have had symptoms. Yeah. So when some you, of their relations actually testified that there were no symptoms. Thank you. So it, the fact that there are no symptoms does not actually mean that there were actually no symptoms. Mm -hmm. It's about yes, we are healthy. Yes, we are alive. But the thing is, how healthy are we? How alive are we? There's no way we will know how healthy or how alive that we, we are if we don't check. So in as much as yes, the relatives could have testified that they don't have any illness at all. These individuals may not have been checking themselves from these predisposing risk factors for sudden deaths. You know, so that takes me back to what could have happened. And it's also an eye opener. Well, these things have been there and we have been talking about them. Do you understand? Um, I wouldn't say good a thing, but this actually now opened everybody's eye. People are now aware of these cardiovascular risk or coronary artery disease risk factors that are actually on the line. So in, these individuals may actually have these, and actually sudden death is actually common in individuals who already have these cardiovascular risk factors. You know, so when I talk about cardiovascular risk factors, I mean has this individual, have they been checking what their blood pressure is? What's their blood sugar readings like? What are the lipids, the cholesterol levels like? How many people exercise? How many are into smoking? Be it you directly smoking or you always sitting with people that are smoking. The risk is the same. So how alive are we? How healthy are we? How do we exercise? How do we eat? How much salt do we take? How much food containing trans fat do we eat? So that is how healthy are we in the sense, yes, we are healthy. So, sorry to go to So when I see the people that smoke or I smoke, I have uh, a risk. You, uh, the risk isn't too much. There's no difference. The risk is not, the difference isn't much. We call active smoking. You are the one smoking. Person sitting next is a passive smoker. The risk is not much between the person who is actively puffing and the person who is sitting mm -hmm. by. So that is how bad cigarette smoking is. Is, is, is a risk factor, a sure risk factor for coronary artery disease that is for sudden cardiac death and it is not taking sudden death syndrome. Okay, so if it takes us to what are the causes of this sudden death? Apart from, yes, there's this underlying cardiovascular risk. And you know, when there's this cardiovascular risk 
factors in any individual. It predisposes the individual to hypertension, predisposes the individual to diabetes, to hypercholesterolemia, and all that and all that. And in this era where there's westernization, a lot of us take a lot of junk. You know, a lot of us are bigger than what we should. Do you understand? So basically, these are factors that actually underline this sudden death, of which if we're able to take care, yes, in as much as this sudden death may actually not be caused by some of these cardiovascular risks, in that there are some of them that are actually genetic, you know, mm. they, it's inherent in our genes. And there's no way we're going to find out we have this, except if we screen, and if one is maybe privileged to actually undergo some of these um, um, investigations, you know, these tests that are, yes, pretty expensive, but it's not something we just screen. We don't just, the fact that, yes, there are certain deaths everywhere doesn't mean that we have to screen everybody who is at risk and all that. So that is where family history also comes into play. Do you understand? So if an individual has had somebody who's had a sudden death, that means death before 40 or 45, you know. If an individual has somebody, a family, immediate family, who's had a sudden death, the individual is at risk of the sudden death. So that is where, you know, this thing about autopsy comes in. Yes, there are people, nobody wants to do autopsy. Somebody suddenly dies and none of us wants to find out what actually happened. Because if we find out what actually happened to a relative, our eyes are open. It may place us at risk. Like one of those, some of those gen genetic causes, you know, maybe issues with cardiomyopathy that has to do with the muscles, whether it is familial or whether it is ticking or whether it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or whether they are channelopathies. These are, you know, electrolyte derangements, imbalances in the way the heart functions. There's no way you know these things are that. You know, you can only know, like, maybe the sudden death. It can just present like that. Do you understand? So, but if a family, a relative has had a sudden death, there has been a sudden death in the family. Okay, so Dr. Nanka, sorry to cut you short. You were talking about um, exercising. Now, this is, I have a friend who was a dancer because he's it. He was a dancer. And then he went out this particular day saying he was going for a dance class and all of that. And we had a slumped, just like that. He didn't complain of anything. He wasn't sick. So what do you say happened in a case like that? I believe, is it a young person or is it an older person? He's a young person. He's a young person. Yes. So that is where the query, query, genetic, mm. query, query, what we are predisposed, our genetic, um, um, with genetic influence comes in to play. So usually when we talk about sudden deaths, there's usually two broad, um, on top of the list, two causes, cardiac causes, you know, of sudden death, you know. So when in individuals less than 35, there has been known to be some causes in that age range. And from 45 up, there's also causes that are peculiar to these individuals. So when we talk about the sudden death, the one we're talking about, you know, from 45 up, yes, we're talking about the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, the coronary artery disease factors. So we'll have younger people falling off, you know, slumping and dying, the genetic component plays more part there. So we begin to talk about those genetic causes, the chalopathies, you know, the, the hypertrophic muscles, and even the dilated muscles. So that is where the genes come to play. And exercises usually predispose some of these individuals who have the background genetic factors to sudden death. So who knows what could have happened? It could be anything. It may not necessarily be from the heart, really. Like, uh, you know, we haven't exhausted the causes, actually. It may not necessarily be. There are some, especially in those younger people, you know, there can't be malformations with the brain vessels. And all of a sudden, maybe with the exercise and activity, the, the, the vessels constrict, and there can be a sudden rupture of the vessels in that she, he or she could have had um, AV malformations with the cerebral vessels. Okay, so is there a difference between uh, cardiac arrest and a heart attack? Yeah, there is. What are the key signs? Um, well, yes, okay, let me differentiate both now. When we talk about how, like, okay, let me, let me just go a bit of anatomy, what happens to the heart. You know, the heart is like a muscle, it's a block of the muscles. And yes, it's a muscle, it pumps blood to other parts of the body. It also supplies its own blood supply. The heart also supplies it, it, itself, you know. So when we talk about heart attack, it's a problem with the, heart, the blood supply to the heart itself. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So what we call the coronary arteries, 
So these are the blood supply to the heart. So I want to talk about heart attack. It's a problem with the coronary arteries in that there could have been a blockage in those vessels supplying the heart itself. It may not necessarily be blockage. When we talk about blood, we talk, oh yes, hypercholesterolemia, atherosclerosis. It could also be that these coronary vessels are coming from a part of the heart that is not supposed to come from, you know, malformations, congenital abnormalities. So I know the heart carries oxygen. So when it's not coming from where, the, you know, the heart has two chambers, kind of four chambers. So one side is probably oxygenated, the other side is not probably oxygenated, kind of. So when those vessels are not coming from that part that has enough oxygen to supply the heart and is coming from a place with less oxygen, the individual is at risk. You know, so that's a heart attack that can occur. So but the general heart attack that we're very used to is that one that happens when there are this cholesterol deposits blocks the vessel supplying the heart. That is heart attack. When we talk about cardiac arrest, now the heart also generates impulses. You know, when the heart beats, the heart is beating. So something actually, let me see, like electrical impulses. We call it electrical impulses. So that's how the heart actually generates the way it pumps um, the, the blood. You know, so when there's a problem with this electrical impulse generation, impulse generation or even impulse propagation of the heart itself, that's what we call cardiac arrest. Okay, so more of heart attack is more of a blood vessel thing, has is a problem with circulation, while cardiac arrest is more of an abnormality with the electrical um, impulse generation or propagation of the heart. So they are actually two things. Now, heart attack can give you cardiac arrest. When we talk about cardiac arrest, it means the heart has arrested. There's disruption, the heart is no longer conducting. Do you understand? So when there's a blockage with this coronary arteries, that means heart attack can give you cardiac arrest. So that is the way it goes. All right. So are there um, key signs? Okay, yes. Yes. So now, um, key signs in the sense that when there's heart attack, what we call coronary artery diseases in broad, broadly, ischemic heart diseases. We call it coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease, because like I said, it could be from issues with um, congenital anomalies where the arteries are not coming from where they should come or probably because there's artery sclerosis that persists within the coronary arteries. So, usually, an individual who has an ischemic heart disease, mm. that is, who, before he gets to heart attack, can present with just about, maybe just like chest pain on exertion. These individuals may also not even present with any symptoms and the first symptom could be that sudden death. Yeah, but the typical signs, the typical symptoms that a patient, uh, an individual who has coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease, or if care is not taking this heart attack of him, is usually chest pain, which is usually located on the left side with radiation. There are typical um, characteristics of this chest pain, you know, or the individual could actually have palpitations, and if things are not too um, um, controlled, then was the heart failures and all that, because so the patient could have cough, breathlessness, you know, any easy fatigability, any small thing, they get tired. But of importance is that there's atypical symptoms of these um, query, query heart attack. You understand? So apart from the normal chest pain or palpitations, some could just present with nausea. That is, I feel like vomiting. And it's very typical in women is very typical in patients who have diabetes. It's also very typical in elderly women. So they could just come and say, yes, I have pain somewhere. Usually, I have strict pain. I have pain somewhere in the tummy. Or I feel like vomiting, but I, I, I didn't vomit. Or a sudden vomiting. Or sudden, oh, yes, I'm just breathless. So these are atypical symptoms of the heart attack, or apart from the typical one that we know, oh, the chest pain and all that. Yeah. Um, so talk to us about them. Um, are there any updates or advancements in first aid protocols for cardiac arrest that individuals should be aware of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um I think this is um is an opportunity for everybody. Like everybody knows there's something like cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And it plays a very important role. If someone is close to somebody who has suddenly um collapsed, do you understand? What we do can actually help an individual who has suddenly collapsed and is basically normal cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's, it's, yes, it's those things we see in the movies, but it goes a long way to help. Do you understand? So when you're close to, or anybody is close to somebody who has actually
actually suddenly collapsed. Mm -hmm. You understand? The next thing is to make sure that, well, it's a simple thing that we can do before the help, maybe from help, professional help arrives. You understand? So it's cardiopulmonary, meaning you're helping the patient or the individual pump and maintain blood supply from the heart to the to the other parts of the body. So the first thing, if an individual witnesses somebody who suddenly um, slumps, is to actually make sure you and whosoever that collapse is in a, a safe environment. So you move the individual and make sure. So the first thing is to check whether the pulse is there. You know, yes, sudden death may not actually be um, heart. So it's good to check the pulse. And it's a simple thing just to place a pulse there. And if you cannot check the pulse, you can actually check here as well. It might even be easier for the lay people to do. But you don't check the two at the same time. So you just check to see if you can feel the pulse. And immediately if you cannot feel the pulse, is to expose the individual's chest and start our cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It goes a long way, you know, to ensure perfusion from the heart. Even if we cannot deliver the oxygen, you know, mouth to mouth respiration or even mouth to nose respiration before health arrive. So the normal cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which I think is a topic for another day, you know, is to keep depressing. There's a peculiar way to do that. And I think this is an opportunity. Everybody gets, should get to know how to do cardiopulmonary resuscitations. It's not just there in the movies. It's not something that we have to, that we see in the hospitals. It's something everybody should be, should know how to do. For anybody who, even if it's not suddenly, somebody you see that is dying, you think, uh, check the pulse, not the, start something. Because by the time you start that, and maybe if it's heart attack, it's going to prevent the cardiac arrest, because from heart attack, that is what is going to happen. For anything at all, you see somebody dying, and the pulse is not there. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation is the way to go until help arrives. All right, thank you, ma'am. So uh, what recommendations would you give or offer to individuals with hypertension regarding lifestyle, choices, and activities? Okay, now, um, yes, it's obvious that hypertension plays a paramount role in what we have seen, you know, and the fact that we're blacks predisposes us at risk. We are all at risk of hypertension, the fact that we, we're from the black race. Why? It's the genetic in us. That is where the gene comes in. Okay. We are predisposed. So, and many have hypertension. There's no way you will know these things are there unless you check. You have to screen it. How often do you check? Check yearly if you don't have. Keep checking. Do you understand? So it's to check to see if you have hypertension. And apart from hypertension, diabetes is also a risk. The lipids are also there, the cholesterol. These are all, all cardiovascular risks, not only hypertension. Yes, hypertension plays a paramount role. Yes, we know that. You know. So if one has hypertension, it's to start treatment. And it's not about treatment, really, because a lot who have hypertension who are on treatment are not taking the medications. And those who are even taking the medications, the blood pressure is not under control. That is even the, what's, you know, that is the, the meat of the matter. Do you understand? Yes, hypertension, the risky, everybody has it. Yes, taking medication. Oh, yes, some, some are taking medication. They will, take, they, they will not take tomorrow. So meaning the blood pressure is not under control, meaning the individual is also at risk. So I will start from yes. If one doesn't have hypertension, please keep checking. You know, we usually advise yes once in a year. I believe you walk into any hospital, I do that. Come in, oh, I want to check my blood pressure. Oh, please sit down. I'll check your blood pressure. And you go, you're not going to pay for that. Yes, you're not going to pay for it. Because we know what we're fighting. And that is, I think that's what it should be. Nobody should charge anybody for checking blood pressure. You know, so check the blood pressure. And keep checking. And if you have hypertension, actually, if that's because it's the commonest, like we all know, if you have hypertension, are you taking your medications? Are you seeing your doctor? Is that blood pressure under control? Because if that blood pressure is under control, we'll reduce a lot of this um, incidents. In so even frequency. I'm hypertensive, mm -hmm. what should I do or what should I not do? Fine. Apart from taking your medications, the lifestyle medications come into play. So. If one is on the big side, I don't like to use obesity or obese. If one is on the big side, you need to shut off. Make sure your blood, um, your your weight is within the appropriate um, 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 weight where it should be. So one is big, please try to curtail your weight to ensure you're within the appropriate um, weight. All right. So if one takes a lot of salt. Of course, our hypertension, yes, apart from other risks, is salt dependent. We need to reduce the salt intake. 
you know, so usually 1.5 milligrams is what is recommended if you have hypertension, if anybody has hypertension. So when you take more, more than 1.5 milligrams of salt per day, you're basically yourself at risk. So reduction of salt is very important. We take a lot of salt in this environment. You know, so that also matters. What's our diet like? Reduce the salt. What's your trans fats like? What's the cholesterol? What are the lipids that you're taking? What are you doing about this? How often are you exercising? Physical activities matter a lot. If you smoke or you are close to somebody who is smoking, be careful, just run away from that. So these are things we need to do. And of course, more of fruits and vegetables. Usually highlight of more of vegetables. All right, man, Dr. Nick, our time is fast spent. So, um, you know, the Nigerian cardiac released the statement mm -hmm. or so apart from boosting healthcare funding which they actually talked about what additional measures do you propose the government take to promote and facilitate early and routine screening for cardiovascular risk factors okay um just yes. around about this question okay yeah so so yeah it's about yes funds of course we all know that healthcare is pretty expensive mm -hmm. many want to screen but they don't have the money so I think health insurance for all, not basically for people who are civil servants and all that. So if we can reduce the, 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 the cost of health care, actually, it will be in long way. I know a lot of people want to, but they don't have the funds. And even the cost of medications, really. A lot want to take the medications, but they can't buy. So it's health for all. Free health for all. I all think right. it's been a long way. Thank you so way. much, Dr. That was really an educative much. session. Thank so you. we have just been joined by Dr. Neka Udora, consultant cardiologist, UNCH.